Hey, welcome to the Macabre Emporium. Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Macabre Emporium. Hopefully you have already listened to our About Us episode, but if you haven't, I'm David. And I'm Sarah. David and I have been together for a little over seven years, and we wanted to start a new adventure, so we decided to start this podcast. We will bring a new episode every other week. We will both bring you a lesser-known tale or case of true crime, weird history, the paranormal, or anything else that might be odd and interesting. Looking out of the front window of the Emporium from where I'm sitting, I can see that the leaves are starting to change color, and people that are passing by are starting to wear less shorts and t-shirts and more jeans and hoodies. So clearly fall has arrived here. Are you excited about fall being here, Sarah? I am. Yes, I am. I'm super excited that the bugs are going to die. I hate when they fly in my face or crawl on me. I think the crawly ones are the worst. I'm excited for the horror movies that will be coming out on TV. I'm super excited that Freeform will be showing Hocus Pocus about 40 times before <laughs> the season's over. <laughs> can't I can't lie. It's one of my favorite Halloween movies. It always has been. Yeah, it's going to be just like the Christmas story, you know, on Christmas Day when it starts on the hour, every hour on like 15 different channels. Except it's not. They don't do that with Hocus Pocus, though they should, because, I mean, let's be honest, it's one of the best Halloween movies ever made. No, oh, I'm sure they'll probably do that with, you know, John Carpenter's Halloween movies. <laughs> uh, yeah, they do all the time. They, It's like an all year round thing, the Halloween movies. Right, but I'm saying, especially on the day of Halloween, that, you know, it's uh-huh. going to be a non-stop marathon of that movie i'm sure let's see what else fall you get the cozy clothes more coffee cozy blankets chili yep apple cider and pumpkin spice everything yes white bitch time (laughs) but i would have to say probably two of my favorite movies to watch during you know this time of the year anything from you know Evil Dead, or that may or may not have Bruce Campbell in it, and definitely Trick or Treat, you know, one of the most underrated Halloween movies of all time. That's a really good one. Yeah, but you know, but I am also excited about eating, you know, chili probably more than we should this time of year and be sick of it. But you know what? Pizza is also pretty good, you know, watching horror movies as well, too. Hey, speaking of pizza, have you ever heard of the Michigan Pizza Funeral? I have not. Well, here, let me tell you about that. The year is 1973. Richard Nixon is the current president of the United States of America. The Sears Tower will also open this year. The Knicks would beat the Lakers for the championship. The Exorcist would be unleashed onto the world. And a pack of Oreos would cost only 49 cents. Steely Dan, Stevie Wonder, and the OJs would all have hit songs on the Billboard Top 100 hits this year. But to get where our story begins, we have to go back a little bit further than that. Ilario Mario Fabrini immigrated from Fiume, now part of Croatia, with his grandfather to the United States after his father was killed during World War II. After immigrating here, Fabrini joined the United States Army and was stationed in San Diego, California, and served in the Korean War. Olario Fabrini loved San Diego so much that his dream was to retire in San Diego eventually. After the Korean War, he and his wife, Olga, moved to the Detroit area and started Fabrini Pizza. Do you know... The difference between the American pizzas and Croatian style pizza? I've honestly never even heard of Croatian style pizza, so no. Okay. Croatian style pizza is very close to Napoleonian style pizza. Well, how Croatian pizza is different from Americanized pizza is that the sauce is served on the side instead of on the crust itself. And instead of being overloaded with like pepperoni and sausage and, you know, toppings that probably shouldn't be on pizza, they usually have herbs vegetables and thinly sliced sausage mostly and that's it oh okay so let's get back into our story here fabrini's pizzas became very popular in the detroit area that fabrini actually had to start offering delivery of his pizzas that we take for granted today using you know doordash and grubhub and things like that and the other pizzerias in the area you know pretty pissed off at fabrini because now they knew this was a new cost to them they you know to compete with him so was was fabrini like not the inventor of delivery, but he, I'm assuming, was one of the first ones to have delivery as an option. Yes, because with his pizzas, you know, getting popular, he started offering it because the, his demand was so high. Okay. And probably, you know, one person's like, hey, can you, get, you know, deliver that to us? And he just said, yeah, okay, we can do this. 
And then it just became a thing. Yeah. I couldn't find any, you know, concrete information that he was the, you know, the person that was the one that started it. But, you know, at this time, his pizza business, you know, it's booming pretty good. You know, it's getting quite successful with it. And, but he was still in the Army Reserves at this time. And he started hearing rumors about his unit having to be deployed because of the construction of the Berlin Wall. So he ended up selling his business. Thankfully, he was never, you know, deployed back overseas. And he ended up moving to Alpena, Michigan with his wife and started over again, basically. In his downtime, in, now in Alpena, he would make pizzas and freeze them, and then people would start buying his frozen pizzas and taking them home. Ah, the good old take and bake. Yep, pretty much, yeah. With this, you know, a new adventure, you know, the take and bake pizza, basically, you know, that he's selling out of a store, he was selling it to local bars. Sometime during the 1960s, the Heinz Company approached him with an offer he couldn't refuse to help take his pizza home on a much larger scale, you know, like possibly grocery stores. And by 1966, he's making 9,000 pizzas daily in his factory in Osinike, Michigan. 9,000? Yep. That's a lot of pizza. No, he basically went from probably making only, I might guess, or probably maybe 100 a day. I couldn't find any information how he was, many he was making, you know, by hand on to his 9, own. To 9,000? To 9,000 pizzas a day with a factory within a short Jesus. time. Jesus. Now, this is about where our story's going to start taking a turn. Uh, in, in January of 1973, United Canning Company, which supplied Fred Brini's supplier with canned mushrooms that he was using for his pizzas, switched all their machinery over to filling automatically instead of having them manually fill their cans by hand. After some time, the employees of United Canning are starting to notice that a significant number of the cans of mushrooms were starting to swell up. Uh, swelling cans is a huge indicator of a contamination for canned goods. So United Canning Company employees contacted the FDA and they came in and took samples of their mushrooms. And unfortunately, these mushroom samples tested positive for Clostridium botulinum. Botulism is a bacteria that's usually found in soil or water naturally on its own, but it's mostly associated associated food contaminations. It usually takes anywhere from 12 to 36 hours to have symptoms for botulism show up once the, you know, the toxin enters the body. Okay, so what does it do to your body? Because if it's enough to make, like, aluminum expand, what would it do to, like, your soft tissue? Depending on how long, you know, you, before you seek your treatment, it could possibly cause paralysis, um, stomach and intestinal issues, vomiting, diarrhea, mostly for that part. You know, you're going to have a really bad day. Uh, yeah, that doesn't sound like a fun day at all. <laughs> Not really. On February 19th of the same year, the FDA contacted Fabrini about the recalls of the mushrooms and told him he also had to recall all of his pizzas because they could possibly be contaminated them from, with the mushrooms from United Canning. Even though he was pissed about this news that he just received, he really didn't blame anyone for it. After doing, you know, crunching numbers to figure out how many pizzas that might be out there that could have these possible tainted mushrooms on them, he came to the conclusion that it'd be about sixty thousand dollars total between manufacturing and profits that he's going to be lost. And I did put it into an inflation calculator for it, and it came out to be about three hundred eighty-seven thousand five hundred dollars in today's money. Is what he was. His loss was going to be on this. Yeah, and back then that would have been huge. Oh yeah, he knew he was going to have to take a loss on all these pizzas. Basically, it took him about two weeks to gather all the pizzas from all the stores, bars, restaurants that were you know using his pizzas at this time. Does that include throughout like all of Michigan and Ohio where he was selling them? Yeah, I mean he was told by the FDA, hey, you got to pull all your products back in. So that was literally everywhere that you know his pizzas were you know on a store shelf anywhere or in a bar somewhere gotcha even though he was upset about having to you know recall his pieces he decided to have a little fun of it and he decided to have a massive funeral for you know all these pizzas he's made so out in the middle of osinike michigan in the outskirts actually he ended up digging an 18 foot deep hole couldn't find any information about how wide it is after word got out about this event you know several hundred people showed up from the area to you know witness this funeral of, of pizzas even the governor of michigan showed up and he gave a short speech as dump truck after dump truck a full of pizzas just got unloaded into this hole after the, you know the pizzas you know the final truck was de- emptied out while the governor's giving his speech for Brini is actually cooking pizzas for <laughs> <laughs> he's kicking yeah he's cooking pizzas for the crowd that actually had came and gathered for it, and some of the people that did attend were questioning about 
are these pizzas even safe to even eat right now? Even the ones that are being literally cooked in front of them. Yeah, I mean, considering that you're there to bury a shitload of pizzas that were like, you know, toxic. And then you're going to have the dude that created them create a pizza for you and then eat it at yeah. this funeral for fuck a pizza. Like, it doesn't make sense, but it is. Yeah, it is. well, Fabrini, he responded to people question is, well, the governor ate a piece of it and he's still alive. Even through this tragedy with losing all of his pizzas, he had support from his community. He had people offer him stock as collateral if he needed it to get back on his feet. Aww. Church congregations and priests from other churches were praying for him to help that he can hopefully recover from all this. Shortly after all this, the FDA finally retracted its findings on the botulism and the mushrooms from United Canning. This is now this is the most batshit crazy. Being in the seventies, this is how they ended up testing the mushrooms, and you're not you're gonna be like, what the fuck when I tell you this? Tell me. So the way the FDA tested the mushrooms and his pizzas to see if they were possibly contained contaminated is that they fed pieces of of the mushrooms and his pizza to the mice. Yeah, to lab mice. And they died. So it says, yep, it's botulism and whatnot. But they ended up finding out that these mice didn't die from the botulism. They died from a completely other different illness. Even though he got received the news that his pizzas were safe and weren't tainted with the mushrooms, his response of that was, it's like, if they didn't die from botulism, maybe they just didn't like my pizza. Oh, that's <laughs> awful. <laughs> Even though at the beginning, Fabrini didn't blame any of his suppliers for it or the United Canning Company, he did file a lawsuit against both of them, and he had to settle, and his case was finally settled in 1979 for $211,000. Unfortunately, while his pizzas were off shelves in grocery stores, his competitors swooped in and filled in the space where his pizzas were at. By the 1980s, he had no choice but to close his pizza company finally and selling all of his assets for only $5,000. All that work. Just to walk away with 5000 yeah. But there is a silver lining with this a little bit. Okay. Even after all that, he was still able to live out his lifelong dream and retire in San Diego, California with his wife. Aw, well, yay to that. So, fun fact about, you know, Clostridium botulinum, you know, there's a neurotoxin in it. You know what it's used for? I do not. So, botulism also is used as Botox. Huh. Now, would this be the Botox that people use to get rid of lines and wrinkles in their face? Or would this be the Botox that you use, say, <clears throat> like, our niece has to get in her um, her bladder? My guess it would probably be used as a lip filler because, you know, causing the swelling. Okay. Oh, like the swelled mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got you. So that's the pizza funeral of Michigan. That's crazy. I feel really bad for all those mice. That's that's pretty yeah. bad. I'm a little surprised that you never heard of it being from Michigan yourself. <laughs> yep. Nope. Never heard of it. So never even heard of it. It's like, I couldn't find any other little fun facts about the area. <clears throat> there uh -huh. was... Question. Yes. Is there, like... Can you go up there and visit the place that they did this pizza funeral? I looked to see if there was anything like a roadside marker or anything, but I couldn't find anything in Google Images and whatnot. Okay. So kind of piggybacking off of the fact that your story started in Detroit, I'm also going to tell a story that starts in Detroit. Okay, so what kind of story is it that you have? Uh, this one would be true crime. One that hits very close to home. Okay. Born in Detroit, Michigan on the 4th of July, a newborn, Leslie Allen Williams, would grow up and earn himself the titles of serial killer, serial rapist, and necrophile. So before we get to how he became the piece of shit he currently is, let's dig into his upbringing. Leslie. First of all, who names a dude Leslie? I'm just throwing that out there. I know, I mean, you, there's Johnny Cash a boy named Sue, but... I don't know if there was ever proven that that was happened. Anybody that listening and they can actually, com you know, confirm that, please send us an email at macabreimportantpod at gmail.com. <laughs> Leslie seemingly did not have the greatest of childhoods. He grew up in a household with four other siblings and both parents. Leslie's uncle, Jim Jarden, said it best. Five children were born into that family. All of them are still alive but only two of them survived. He did grow up with both parents. His mother, Dorothy Jarden Lashbrook Williams Adams. How many more names can we fit in there? All of them. And his father, Lyle. Dorothy and Lyle began to see each other 
while Dorothy was married to Lyle's best friend. She used saying that her husband was abusive as a means to get away from him and to get with Lyle. Now Lyle, he was a fairly depraved man. He was known for his off-kilter and crude comments, for his dirty jokes. He was also known for being, like, ridiculously mean. Lyle was accused of punishing his toddler children with laxatives. Like, how is that a punishment? I mean, we get probably shown in the corner, you know, spanked, but using laxatives as... Yeah, have you ever taken laxatives? It's been quite some time, but yeah. Like, you get bubble guts like no other that. Like, it hurts. It can be painful. He molested Dorothy's daughters from her previous marriage, which landed him in the Ionia state for the criminally insane, as it should have. Dorothy would have someone watch Leslie more often than she did herself. She became super cold towards her children, all of her children, not just Leslie. She even sent her youngest son to live with an elderly couple for like the first three years he was alive. Lyle would use weapons and attack Dorothy and his children. Whoever was closest is the one that got the brunt of his abuse. He killed Leslie's pet birds. He drove a wedge between Dorothy and her family and forced her into prostitution. Wait, so this is his father that's doing all this? Yes, Leslie's father. Okay. Yes. Dorothy didn't mind the prostitution part of it because it brought her money, you know, and something to do. And it also let Lyle live what he loved the most, which was being a voyeur. He would sit in the closet, sometimes by himself, sometimes with his stepdaughters. How creepy is that? Sometimes with the neighborhood kids. What the fuck? Again, how creepy is that? Well, it's like, hey, come on, little Timmy, I got something I want to show you. What (laughs) the fuck? (laughs) Okay, so either by himself or with his stepdaughters or the neighborhood kids, he would watch what Dorothy, his wife, was doing with these men. In time, the pair were caught doing this and they were arrested for prostitution. While she took up for her husband when the cops came knocking again, this time for being a pedophile and molesting Dorothy's daughters. Nevertheless, it caused Dorothy to take a step back and be there, but never present. She became neglectful and pretty much let Leslie raise himself. And unfortunately for Leslie, he had probably two of the worst role models you could have. Does sound like that. Leslie would start his life of crime at the ripe age of 17 in 1970. He was arrested for the first time for breaking and entering into a home in his neighborhood. He was apprehended multiple times over the next 10 years for crimes that increasingly got worse. He was arrested again in September of 1983 for sexually assaulting a woman in her own home. This resulted in being sentenced to 20 years in prison. After serving eight years in prison for the rape, Williams got granted parole. About nine months after being released on parole, he killed his first victim. And these I am going to say in chronological order. Okay. Just, yeah. September 14th, 1991, 18-year-old Cami Marie Villanueva was attacked near her home in South Lyon. As a document signed by Williams himself states... Williams kidnapped Villanueva while she walked near her home. He choked her to death and then had sex with her corpse before burying her naked body in a shallow grave in the woods. September 29th, 1991. Sisters, 16-year-old Michelle and 14-year-old Melissa Urban of Tyrone Township were killed while taking a walk at night, heading for dinner at their local big boy. Williams raped both of them before smothering them to death. He then put their bodies in his car and drove to Oakwood Cemetery in Fenton, Michigan. Before placing them in shallow graves, he again had sex with both of their dead bodies. January 4th, 1992, 15-year-old Cynthia Marie Jones from Milford. Again, as a signed document by Williams himself states, while he was masked, he kidnapped her at knife point from a park where she was visiting her boyfriend, her boyfriend that he left tied to a tree. He took her to his apartment where he took explicit pictures of her and then stabbed her in the chest before raping her dead body and again burying her half-naked body in a shallow grave. This was not quite confirmed. Um, After his final arrest, Leslie Allen Williams claimed that he also raped a nine-year-old girl, but I wasn't able to find anything like super concrete. So it could have happened and we just don't know about it. I don't know. William stated that after each murder, he would lay awake and cry and question himself as to why he did what he did. 
On May 24th, 1992, Williams tried to rape a woman who was visiting her mother's grave to put a wreath. Like, does this dude, like, have no fucking chill or whatever? Nah. Because, I mean, I've already, like, wanted to beat the shit out of this fucking dude, and you already know I'm not that type of a person in the first place. He is gross. He pulled her into his vehicle. Thankfully, this time, there were people around and saw it happening and called the police. The police caught up to Leslie and found the woman he took in his trunk. He was arrested right there and taken to the police station. While he was at the police station, he confessed to the four murders. Over the course of the next month, William took the police to each victim's burial site. During all of this, he confessed to at least, at least 11 sexual assaults and other various crimes since 1990. Without Williams leading police and detectives to the burial sites and admitting what he had done, it would have been tough to string all of these together as being done by the same person. The differences in ages, the areas of abduction and murder, and ways that each of them were murdered would have easily made it difficult to pinpoint. All right. It sounds very reminiscent of Richard Ramirez because he was basically the same way. He didn't have... No rhyme or reason. Yeah. Yeah. But... With all that said, it would have made it really difficult to pinpoint it on one person just because of the variation in age and location. Right. There's been other serial killers overseas that some of their evidence found, I think, I believe it was Andre Chikatilo, like, that some of the amount of semen that they were found in the crime scenes, I believe there was more than two because of a medical disorder that he had. Ew. So, Yeah. He probably would have been very popular in certain industries if he wouldn't have been this shitbag serial killer in his time. Ugh. I've seen pictures of his face and I don't think he would have lasted in that yeah. industry. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's weird. It's just like you see these, you know, like you hear these stories of serial killers and you look up these pictures it's like, oh, that's what that guy looks like? That's somewhat close to what I was thinking. Ick. Nah. Yeah, if you're ever curious, you know, when we're in these stories, it's like look these people up and you're gonna realize that everybody's a pretty face like ted bundy now i know that i keep mentioning you know all these big names or giving them only as points as reference you will not hear you know stories of them on our show correct correct that's not gonna happen williams told investigators that he would go back occasionally and visit the shallow graves of the girls that he killed once caught williams told the michigan state police detectives i don't want to cause any more trouble I don't want to cause taxpayers any grief. I just want to be locked up. Lock me up so I don't do it again. I have no control over my life. But yet, he still was causing us grief by having him housed in prison. Correct. And breathing our air. Yeah, mostly, you know, wasting air for more important people. Correct. There was a lot of controversy surrounding this case, as many felt that the state of Michigan in general, the parole board, and the justice system failed these girls by allowing him out in the first place because i said they let him out on parole from raping that woman right. nine months after that he's killed four girls yeah if they would have just kept him in there you know none of this would have happened but you know hey yeah that's how awesome our justice system is correct and it's only gotten better yeah in 1992 leslie allen williams was sentenced to life in prison for the four murders as well as the attended attempted rape of the woman he snatched in his vehicle. It was found out that Williams kept a scorecard of each victim's physical appearances and he collected trophies or souvenirs from each of them. I wasn't able to find out the information of what he kept from each right. of the girls, but I can only imagine it's like a piece of jewelry, right? something like that. Now, present day, this fucker is still alive, well, unfortunately. Yeah, that is unfortunate, you know. He's 69 years old. Currently serving multiple life sentences at the Carson City Correctional Facility in Carson City, Michigan. Would you like to know what he was sentenced with? Sure, but I'm sure it's probably going to irritate the fuck out of me. (laughs) Probably. Five counts of kidnapping, five counts of criminal sexual conduct, three counts of first degree murder, two counts of homicide, premeditated, one count of breaking and entering an occupied building with intent, one count of assault with intent to commit murder, one count of weapons, felony weapons. One count of assault with attempt to commit a felony. That's it. That's all he got. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's all he got. So he was never actually charged with murder, just a lo- huge laundry list of everything but that. Three counts of first degree murder. Okay. And then two counts of ho- premeditated homicide. Okay. Now, you remember in the beginning, before I started the actual story, I said that it hit pretty close to home. Mm-hmm. I was seven or eight years old when this happened, and before moving to Indiana, I lived in Fenton, where Michelle and Melissa were murdered and buried. I hadn't remembered this until it was brought up by my older sister recently, and then it all came rushing back. I remember the news, I remember my older sister telling myself, and I believe our other sister, about it when we were geocaching in Oakwood Cemetery. She showed us where the bodies were found on the other side of a hill behind an in-ground mausoleum. Now I visit there every time David and I make it back to Michigan to see my family, but for much more personal reasons. My mother and grandmother are buried side by side, right down the trail from where all this happened. It gives me chills thinking about how many times I have passed that mausoleum thinking nothing of it. But I bet from here on out, especially with you, after hearing the whole story, that it won't be as easily passable. No, especially for me, no. I mean, that mausoleum that's in there, I mean, I've never seen that in any other places. And, like, not even Crown Hill that we visited earlier this year. Mm -hmm. You know, I might have to do an episode on that at some point. Even the mausoleums in there, they're impressive. That one still there was unique, and I'm probably never going to be able to look at it the same way now every time we go in there for a visit. If you're interested in a little more in-depth look into this case, there is a TV series, or was, I'm not sure if it's still out. Uh, called the Lake Erie Murders. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, I don't think I have. Well, they shed some light on this case with an episode called The Vanishing Teens that they did in 2018. I also got some of my information from a book called Born Bent, A Map into the Mind of a Serial Killer by Mick Strasser. It was really good. I read it on my Kindle. (laughs) (laughs) But it's all about him. Also, numerous Google searches, but I'm pretty sure for anybody that looks up anything online, that goes without saying. And that is one of my true crime stories. Yeah, yeah I've never heard of Leslie Ellen Williams, but I don't know, maybe we should come up with some other name for these killers that we might cover. So they're not kind of getting, uh, I don't know, recognition for, you know, their crimes or whatever. You know, I don't even think that we could give them a name that would justify how fucking monstrous they are right i mean so i don't know maybe if you think we can come up with something to call them we do have an email and that email is macabreemporiumpod at gmail.com and we also have a facebook group macabreemporium so maybe join us in one of those or send us a message on the email about what we could call any of the serial killers we might possibly cover in either one of those also if there are any lesser known true crime, paranormal, anything kind of stories from your area that you would like to hear us talk about. Oh, yes, that's a great idea. Send us an email. So with both of our stories out of the way, I would like to personally thank you for joining us for our very first episode. Yes, thanks for joining us. And hopefully you come back for episode two, even though this might be kind of a burning carousel on fire that's rolling down a hill on its side or something. I'm not sure because we're still trying to figure all this out and hopefully it gets easier in time. But I've been having a lot of fun with all this. What about you, Sarah? Same. I have. And oh. also, just so you know, we're just starting out. Like, we're still learning the software, you know, to do the whole editing thing. We're going to fuck up. It's going to happen. Right. We're going to get better also. So what did you think you might do for your next episode? It's a toss-up. I have an urban legend that I could do. Okay. And there's another true crime one that I could also do. Yeah. I have a feeling that people are going to kind of see our differences right. in what we like to listen to. Because I like to listen to the true crimey, like haunting, mm-hmm. paranormal, that kind of stuff. Right. Whereas you're more like crazy history, cryptids. You like the you know hauntings too, right. though. But I think they're probably going to get more out of me in terms of like true crime, paranormal. And they're going to get the, like, crazy history, other stuff from I mean, you. that could, you know, very well be just how our format goes. But I mean, there's be. a little bit of something for everybody. Right. So it's like, even though it's three of my possible show ideas that I have listed out right now, they could be, I wouldn't say weird, but they're kind of a weird true crime thing because it's such a unique situation. Mm-hmm. And they also could be considered one of the first of its kind of things at the time because there weren't terms like you know mass casualty or mass yeah. shooter or anything like that to turn like a term like that at the time that these events 